Okay. Um, before we go into a little bit of what we did last week and cover today's content, uh, would anyone be able to open us in prayer, please? That's right. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, I just give this whole class into your hands as we are learning about your truth. Help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it and understand the deep revelations of your word, Jesus. We give Svita Ma'am into your hands. Uh, you guide her, fill her, with, fill her with your Holy Spirit and your wisdom and knowledge and understanding as she's teaching us. And I pray for all my classmates who are here and who are about to join. Help us to understand, Jesus, you be our teacher, you guide us, and help us to grow more uh, in our relationship with you today. Help us to have a good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session, and let this class be done for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. Okay, so let's do a quick review of what we covered last week, and then we'll go into... Uh, we also have to answer two questions Jeffina had asked in the last two classes, so we look at that, and then go into today's content. Uh, would anyone like to um, talk about some of the things we covered last week? So last week, we looked at... Um, 1 Corinthians 5.5 5 to 6 um, I just summarize what we are seeing uh, from chapter 5. I hope you can hear me. Um, in chapter 5, we uh, saw about uh, this chapter actually talks about uh, the sexual immorality. And uh, Paul was saying that his correction was com is coming from the authority of Jesus. And we also saw what it actually means uh, for a person to be handed over to Satan. And the ultimate goal was him to uh, repent from the sin uh, through the forgiveness of Christ. Uh, and then we also saw what this unleavened bread means. It means uh, sincerity and truth. And... Uh, I liked how you said, uh, grace without trust is just a fake love. And trust without grace is just a set of rules. Uh, so both should actually come along. Um, and we also saw that nothing is a big sin or, or a small sin. Sin is actually a sin. And that's what we talked about in chapter 5. In chapter 6, we talked about... Uh, the judgment place that was in the uh, marketplace, which was a kind of an entertainment for those people. And um, we also saw this, whether it is okay to go to the courts and how to solve disputes uh, among the believers. And uh, we, sh we came to know that firstly, we should address with the person alone next the church and next the uh, outsider. And we saw that Paul is calling the church to holiness over this place. Um, yeah, and we saw that there is no place for sin to exist in the body of Christ uh, because it's contrary to the identity in Christ. And we also saw that how Paul was saying, like, uh, food is for the stomach, stomach is for the food. It actually meant that the body is for the sex and sex is for the body, for the people. Um, and we talk, uh, the whole chapter actually talks about how to keep the church pure and holy. Uh, and in the end, we see uh, like how we can keep ourselves also uh, pure and holy. Um, and then in chapter seven, we talked about 
we just started i believe so so it just told about we will see about the importance of sex with marriage gift of singleness staying in our marriage and uh, yeah we just finished by this thought i believe so we were talking about it we just started and i just wrote this the body is given to each other so they should know to treat it uh, with reverence so basically we talked about sexual immorality that's happening how to carry ourselves in holiness and how to carry our, our church in holiness thank you um I think the best way to learn is to have to uh, teach others. So uh, when you're repeating what you're learning, it's just a good way to uh, reiterate some of the things that you've learned in class. Uh, so the reason why we like to go back to what we have done in the last class is just to gain some context before we go into today's, um, today's passage so that we remember what were we talking about and how uh, is Paul then adding on to what he's saying, uh, what he has said before. Uh, so <clears throat> before we continue, um, or maybe we'll uh, just before the break, we'll just address those two questions. Um, but we can uh, continue in the passage uh, that we read. So yes, in the beginning of uh, chapter 7, uh, Paul begins to talk about sex within marriage. And he talks about how a husband and wife should honor one another uh, through the giving of uh, their bodies to one another. Uh, so each of them gives a body to the other person without claiming authority over their own body. And uh, it is as we uh, give our bodies to one another that uh, we are able to both honor the marriage, we are also able to show love to one another, and um, that we are able to protect our marriage against uh, temptation that comes from the outside. So if we are not uh, within our marriage, uh, using this gift of sex to express love to one another, then uh, what happens is that Satan will bring it from the outside. And so your marriage then is corrupted and broken uh, because you have not taken the time to protect your marriage. Uh, and um, you've not taken the time to show love to one another through sex, which is uh, restricted to marriage, right? So in scripture, the only uh, moral way to, uh, to practice sex is within the context of marriage. And so if you are not doing it within the context, if you are married and you're not doing it uh, in your marriage, then uh, that that desire for sex is going to be there in each individual and so they will look to satisfy it outside of the marriage and so uh, when paul is talking about this he's saying protect your marriage uh, from temptation from uh, allowing satan to come in uh, and use something that uh, you have not been doing in your marriage he's using that against you so um this is the uh, the main part, uh, the main content that he covers from verses 1 to 5. Verse 6, he says, but I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. So uh, he's talking about that, uh, what he says in verse 5. He says, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. So uh, he's saying, you can do this, but you don't have to. This is not a command that you should take time off uh, from sex and spend time in fasting and prayer. He's saying, uh, if you choose to do this, then after some time, make sure that you all are coming back together. Uh, so while uh, some people may think, OK, not not engaging in sex and only spending time in prayer, that is a spiritual thing to do. Uh, but the problem with that is that because those natural physical desires are there in us as humans, we are opening ourselves to temptation. And so if we don't satisfy that desire, uh, we are actually, um, we're actually not doing the right things spiritually, right? We are uh, allowing ourselves to be tempted. We are giving room to, the, uh, to Satan to come into our marriages. So he's saying, don't uh, 
consider only the spiritual things of fasting and prayer. Also consider uh, that there is a physical need and that physical need should be satisfied because if you don't satisfy the physical need, then it will become a place of uh, temptation and a place where you can fall spiritually. Is that clear? So it's a good balance uh, for us also to understand that we are spiritual and physical beings. Um, we um, So the whole practice of asceticism where uh, the, only the spiritual things are valued and physical things are forgotten. So this, uh, like you give up all physical things and only pursue spiritual enlightenment or spiritual knowledge. Uh, that is not what uh, scripture teaches. Scripture very much acknowledges that we are physical beings, that we have physical needs uh, in every way, right? We need food, we need, uh, we need our physical needs to be met. There's so much teaching on, um, how to share when you, if you have an extra cloak, give one of your cloaks to someone in need. So all of those things are very real needs that are acknowledged in scripture. Uh, so apart from the spiritual, uh, to also acknowledge that our bodies have been given by God and the needs that we have, the desires that we have are from God. Uh, but there is a way in which those needs and desires should be met uh, in a way that is approved by God and is ordained by God. So let's go on to verse 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 7. Uh, if someone can read verses 7 to 9. Chapter 7, verse 7. For oh, I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God. One is this manner, and another is another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise their control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So here we read, um, so Paul is talking about his own his own position, right? He is uh, single and he's saying that he wishes that everyone would be single, would be unmarried. Uh, but he's recognizing that this is a gift that he's received from God. He's not able to be single because of uh, his own decision, but God has given him this gift of singleness. And because he has that gift, he's able to, uh, he's able to remain unmarried without falling into temptation so he's saying if you have that gift if uh, if god has given you this gift then remain single but if you don't have this gift you have some other gift then uh, you act according to the gift that you have right so um singleness actually was not very common in that day, especially among Jews, right? Jews uh, viewed marriage as the right thing to do because God had given the command to be fruitful and multiply. So they uh, viewed singleness as uh, sin because you're not following that command, that original blessing that God gave to people. Um, so Paul was not doing what was uh, right by Jewish tradition and Jewish thought. Uh, on the other hand, there were philosophers who thought that marriage, uh, you shouldn't tie yourself down to marriage, uh, that if you get married, uh, you are somehow uh, restricting yourself. But they approved of you like expressing your sexual desires uh, with prostitutes, with outside of marriage. Uh, but they didn't think that you have to get married. And in fact, they didn't encourage marriage. So Paul is uh, not going in that direction, right? He's not saying, don't get married, but you can express your sexual needs in any other way. He's saying, if you have these sexual needs, then 
you express it in the right context, which is in the context of marriage. But if you don't, if you have the gift uh, of singleness, which God has given you, and he'll talk a little bit more about that in the next two verses. Uh, if you have that gift, then uh, it's better to stay unmarried. And he'll also explain why it's better to stay unmarried. Uh, so when he's talking about a gift, he's uh, he uses the word charisma, which is a Greek word and it means gift of grace. This is the same word that's used for the gifts of the spirit later on when uh, Paul talks in um, chapter 12 about the gifts of the spirit. Uh, he uses the same word. So. Um, it's definitely something that only the Holy Spirit can enable. Just like the gifts of the Spirit come from the Holy Spirit, this gift of singleness is from the Holy Spirit. Uh, so it's an important gift for us to acknowledge and celebrate within the church. I think uh, we also very often can fall on one side or the other, right? We can fall on one side of thinking everyone has to get married. That is the right thing to do. It's the best thing for everyone. Um, but here Paul is saying maybe not the best thing. Maybe you have a gift of singleness and you can use that to serve God uh, more fully. You can commit your time, your energy, your uh, your attention, your um, focus, everything that you're doing can be focused on God. Whereas if you're married, then you also have to think about your family, your spouse, and you have other responsibilities that are added on. Uh, on the other hand, we can fall on the other side of saying, yes, it's better to never get married, uh, to just say single, to stay single so that you can focus on ministry. But he doesn't go to that side either because he says that is only available to people who have that gift from God. But if you don't have that gift, then don't try and do it in your own strength or try and do it with your own um with your own desires because you will face temptation and then you are opening yourself up to temptation. So if you have self-control, which is what he says in verse uh, nine, if you can exercise uh, self-control, then it's better not to marry. But if you're not able to exercise that self-control, then get married because otherwise you'll have all of these desires within you and uh, how you express those desires uh, will or may result in sin right so it's better to protect ourselves spiritually and uh, get married in that case so uh, there's a note here in your uh, textbook that just uh, kind of keeps us from misinterpreting this verse. So uh, some people say, uh, even if you're not married, you have sexual desires that need to be expressed. And so uh, instead of burning with those desires, it's better to just express it. But that's not what this passage is saying, right? It's saying, if you have those desires, get married. It's not saying you can just express those desires outside of marriage. Uh, on the other hand, if you have some bondage to sexual sin, if you have some temptation or some kind of sexual sin uh, that has control over you, don't look at marriage as the escape from that sin. So a lot of people think, once I get married, I'm not going to have this temptation anymore. Uh, for example, pornography. A lot of people think, uh, if I get married, then I won't be tempted to watch pornography. But that is a sin uh, and a, that is kind of different from uh, marriage. It is a wrong view of sex and uh, can have bondage over you. So marriage is not going to free you from bondage to uh, that kind of sin. It's Jesus who frees us from bondage. And marriage is just a good and right way to express our sexual desires. Uh, let's go on to verses 10 to 16. Uh, would somebody be willing to read those verses for us, please? Yeah. 
uh, 10 to 16. Now to the merit item one. Okay. Now to the merit I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. Even, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife, but to the rest, I know the Lord say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God, but God has called us to peace. For how do you, you know, O oh wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O oh husband, whether you will save your wife? Thank you. So uh, here Paul gives a few instructions or commandments, uh, and he's distinguishing between what is a clear commandment from God and what are some things that he himself is uh, telling the church to do. Uh, now, even though he said it's it's very important where he's distinguishing, right? So he's making that point to distinguish. Uh, but at the same time, because he is someone who had uh, received so much revelation from God and uh, had walked so closely with God, even these instructions for us, we take as uh, authoritative because it has come uh, from Paul in this context, right? So he's still giving us instructions and we're still going to consider them as important instructions because of his relationship and his revelation from God. Uh, so this first part, verse 10, he's giving a clear commandment from the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. That is uh, very clear. So that doesn't mean uh, the husband is able to depart from the wife, right? Just because he said a wife is not able to depart, a wife is not allowed to depart. So he goes on to say, if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. So he's made it very clear. Divorce is not acceptable uh, by, according to the Lord, right? Yet not I, but the Lord says, a wife is not to depart and a husband is not to divorce his wife. Um, so in scripture, there are just two uh, instances when uh, divorce is allowed. And uh, we can see that um, <clears throat> where Jesus talks to the Pharisees in Matthew 19, 3 to 11. Uh, so they come to him because divorce was something that men were practicing quite uh, liberally. Whenever they felt like it, they would decide that they were going to divorce their wife for any small reason, uh, which may not be very different from uh, our present context where divorce is so common. Uh, so they were going to Jesus to get an excuse to be able to divorce, right? So we, we want to just have a confirmation from somebody in authority that it's OK to go divorce our wives. Uh, but what does Jesus say? He says he goes back to Genesis when God first created Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, and first instituted marriage. He says, um, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So when you have become one, uh, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Right, And then the Pharisees ask, why did Moses allow that a certificate of divorce can be given? If it is against God's will that, so, uh, that people should divorce, why did Moses allow it? So um, here Jesus states two, uh, he states uh, uh, this one reason of sexual immorality. So he says, it is not God's will for you to be divorced, but because people's hearts are hard, there is divorce allowed in certain circumstances. Okay, and the one he mentions here is sexual immorality. If somebody uh, 
commits adultery, this is the only time that it is okay for you to divorce them uh, and marry someone else. If that is not the case, if you divorce and you get married, then you are commit committing adultery. Um, so we see here one context in which divorce is allowed. But we cannot uh, pick up our own reasons, right? That uh, oh, there's something wrong with this person. I didn't know about it before, and now I know it. And I don't like this thing about them, so I'm going to get divorced. Uh, none of those things are allowed according to scripture. Uh, another case in which divorce is allowed is uh, divorce is permitted by God is if there is abandonment. Uh, so if the person, uh, the spouse leaves the person uh, alone and never returns, then in this case, divorce is permitted because they have not left their spouse. The spouse has left them and is unwilling to come back. Uh, so we'll see Paul talk about that in verse 15. Uh, so when he's saying uh, God has said divorce is not allowed, he's mentioning this within the context of the whole of scripture, where we also see that sexual immorality is one reason when divorce is permitted. Uh, but God's ideal is always that there be reconciliation. So in verse 10, we see, uh, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled. So uh, you can never get divorced and remarry unless there has been sexual immorality or abandonment. Uh, but you can try and be reconciled to your husband, right? Instead of uh, getting divorced, or if you got divorced, try and come back and be reconciled to your husband. Uh, so that reconciliation is, uh, the Greek word is um, katalaso, which is a mutual change. So both parties bringing in a willingness to uh, come together to make the change that's needed to make the marriage work. We go on to verse 12 to 13. Uh, so here, Paul says, uh, now this is not a commandment from the Lord. This is me speaking. The previous one was a clear commandment from God. And now Paul says, OK, uh, now not what God has commanded, but what I am advising is that if you are married to an unbeliever, then don't divorce them uh, if they are willing to remain with you. So whether it's a husband who's married to a believing wife or a wife married to a believing husband, if your spouse is not a believer, uh, but they are willing to stay, remain with you, then don't divorce, uh, divorce them. Now, uh, this is not saying that you can marry an unbeliever. This is saying if you are married and you have become a believer because, uh, because all of these people were first uh, first generation believers, right? They had come to faith at that time. So they may have already been married and then come to faith. Uh, so he's saying, if you were married in this context, right? You were already married and now you've become a believer, but your spouse is not a believer, uh, then don't try to divorce them because divorcing, uh, God has already, you've already come together, uh, you've already become one. Uh, now you cannot divorce them because you've become a believer. Instead, stay in that marriage if they are willing to remain with you, if they are willing to remain married to you. Um, and he explains further why he is saying that. So he says here, um, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Uh, otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Uh, so this is uh, something that's quite amazing, right? So uh, earlier we see where he forbids uh, having sex with a prostitute because he says, how can you take what 
belongs to God, uh, that is a member of God's Christ's body, take that and bring it together with a prostitute. Uh, so you're defiling the body of Christ because you have uh, engaged with the prostitute, you've engaged in sin. Now, on the other hand, he's saying you can take the same body that is holy, uh, this body that is a member of Christ's body, and be uh, in relationship with your husband or wife, and you will actually make that person holy. So in one case where you were defiling the body of Christ, here you are taking the holiness and you are impacting your spouse. Uh, so that's the difference between sex when it is in the context of marriage and sex when it is outside of marriage in the context of uh, being married, uh, having sex with a prostitute. Uh, so a beautiful thing where um, because it's happening in the context of marriage, it's happening in a way that is in line with God's will. Uh, God will use that to bless your spouse. Uh, because you are a believer, he will bless your spouse and he will bless your children, the children that are born through your union with your spouse. Um, now, um, there was a lot of questions in that day and it's actually i think similar to things we've seen in history and maybe present day where the status of children uh, that were from a mixed cultural background would be questioned right so in the greco-roman view uh, if there are children from two different cultures what is their status because it's very clear if it's in the roman culture this is their status if they're uh, greek this is their status. But if it's a Greek and Roman mixture, then what is that child's status? Uh, on the Jewish side, it was if there's a mixture of religions, what is the status of the child? Is that child uh, accepted within the Jewish community? Uh, so those were the questions that were asked. So here Paul is saying, so as believers, if you are a believer and your spouse is an unbeliever and you were already married before you became a believer, uh, then your children will be considered as holy. So he's giving a clear status of they are uh, blessed, uh, they are sanctified because uh, they are uh, they are birthed within the context of this marriage. Okay, but he also goes on to distinguish between what it means to be sanctified and what it means to be saved. So in verse sixteen, he he says. Uh, how do you know whether your husband will be saved or whether your wife will be saved? He's not saying that sanct uh, being sanctified means they are saved. There's a difference. Okay, They're going to uh, be in some way special uh, to the Lord because they are uh, in a family with this believer. But they will not be saved because of that believer. That, there's a difference. Okay, I hope that's clear. OK, but in verse 15, we see the second grounds for divorce, right? Where divorce is allowed. If the believer departs, if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in some in such cases. But God has called us to peace, right? So where the unbeliever says, no, I don't want to be married to you, and they leave you, uh, in that case, you do not have to remain married to uh, you don't have to stay married to them because they have chosen to leave you and you can't force somebody else to stay in a relationship with you it has to be a mutual uh, mutual agreement right between husband and wife so he says in that case you are free you are not uh, you don't have to remain under that agreement of marriage Okay, so uh, we'll just look at also 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6. Um, yeah, maybe I think we just need to read the one verse, uh, 1 Peter 3, 1. I can read that for us. So it says, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. So uh, the same kind of teaching where, uh, where Peter, in this case, is saying the same thing. He's saying wives and husbands. So wives, submit to your husbands so that when they see your life, they will become a believer uh, based on your conduct. They see your life and they are convinced about who Christ is 
when they see your life. So uh, this is, again, the context of one being a believer and the other being an unbeliever. In this case, where the wives are believers, and the husband is an unbeliever. So he's saying, submit to your own husband so that they may see Christ in you, and maybe they will be won over to Christ. OK, we have just a few minutes. So we'll just go to uh, Jeffina's questions. And then when we come back, we'll continue in this. So there were two questions that Jeffina had asked in the last two classes. Uh, the first one uh, was that Paul had expressed a desire to go back to uh, Corinth after he had uh, visited them the first time. So his first visit was uh, during his second missionary journey, and he spent about 18 months there. Um, and then during his third missionary journey is when he wrote first and second Corinthians. So uh, while he was traveling through Ephesus and Macedonia, so in Ephesus is where he wrote first Corinthians, and in Macedonia is where he wrote second Corinthians. Uh, so her question was, did he ever go back to Corinth because he expresses a desire to go back? Uh, so he expresses that desire while he's on his third missionary journey. So from Macedonia, in Macedonia, he writes 2 Corinthians. And from Macedonia, he went to Greece. OK, so Corinth is in Greece. Uh, it isn't clear whether he actually went to Corinth in that time. But because he was in Greece, it is very possible that he did go to Corinth during that time. So uh, if we see Acts 22 to 3, it says, uh, from Macedonia, they finally arrived in Greece, and they spent three months in Greece. So they were there for about three months. So uh, it's quite possible that they went to Corinth during that time. Uh, the second question uh, she'd asked about was the spiritual protection over the church. So we uh, had looked at, um, <clears throat> I think it is chapter 6. Or is it chapter 5? Let me just pull it up. Yeah, it's chapter 5, verse 5, uh, where Paul is, uh, this First 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, uh, Paul is talking about the man who is uh, having sex with his father's wife. And so he says, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Um, and we were talking about what does it mean for someone to be handed over to Satan. Uh, so uh, we had looked at um, what the meaning of it is and how we see it played out in this Corinthian um, in the Corinthian context, right? In the in verse thirteen, he says, "Expel the wicked person from among you." So he's uh, basically telling them to send this person outside of the church. This person is no longer going to be included within the body of Christ because he is bringing corruption and he's bringing sin into the body of Christ. Uh, but this body is supposed to be holy. And so uh, anyone that's sinning has to be removed from the body. And uh, we said that when he's being removed from the body, he's being removed from uh, fellowship and communion with other believers and also from spiritual protection that covers uh, the church. Um, so one side of that spiritual protection is the fact that um, as believers, we are called into fellowship to encourage and to uh, sharpen one another in our faith, right? We are, uh, we help one another stay in step with God. We help one another stay accountable uh, to continue to walk with the Lord. And that's why fellowship in the church is so important. Uh, so when we're saying that he's removed from that fellowship, he no longer has that kind of encouragement from other believers. And so he's um, weakening his own spiritual standing. He's uh, He doesn't have other people he can depend on, other people who will correct him, other people who will encourage him and uh, help him walk in faithfulness to, the God, uh, to God. On the other hand, uh, there is uh, Christ's covering over the church. So uh, we can turn to Ephesians 1, uh, 1 18 onwards. 18 to 22. <clears throat> so the whole of Ephesians talks a lot about the church, uh, but we'll just look at two passages from Ephesians. So Ephesians 1, 18 to 22. Um, 
I'll just read that. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church okay so um christ is given this place of authority and power over every other power that exists and then christ himself is placed as the head over all these things and over the church uh and then if we go on to the end of ephesians uh ephesians 5 29 um it's talking about the husband and wife relationship. And then uh, he's saying, he's talking about the husband and wife and saying how the husband should protect and love his wife uh, and uh, also take care of her body. And then he says in verse 29, for no one ever hated his own body, but instead he nourishes and protects and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Okay, so Christ is given this headship over the church. Christ is in a power, uh, in a place of position, authority, power, dominion. And he is put as the head of the church. And in that place of authority, he uh, covers the church. He protects it. He nourishes it. He uh, takes care of it. And so all those who are part of the body of Christ uh, can experience that protection. It's like how if we compare it to our families, right? Uh, the father kind of acts as the one who takes care of the family, who is um, <clears throat> taking care of their needs, protecting them from uh, dangers that are around, whatever those dangers might be. And uh, in the same way, and in a much greater way, Christ does that over the church. As And um, in Ephesians, specifically talking about the husband and wife, how the husband protects the wife, uh, here he says Christ protects the church. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I think we just have a minute. Is there any other questions that anyone would like to ask? Yeah, go ahead. So as we are looking at this, this Corinthians chapter 7, uh, I just want a little more definition on verse 16. Uh, where it says, how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife. Uh, so that it talks about salvation or just... Uh, yes, it is specifically talking about salvation. So that's how we know that when he's talking in verse 14 about being sanctified, being made holy, uh, that is different from what he's saying in verse 16. So he's saying, yes, your spouse and your children will be, uh, they will be holy. Uh, but verse 16, he's saying, you, how do you know whether they will be saved? So stay in that marriage so that you can influence them so that they can be saved. Uh, but don't leave the marriage thinking, I'm a believer, they are not a believer. Um, so we can't be together. Instead, stay there with the desire to see them saved. Uh, so like uh, First Peter also talks about, First Peter 3, 1 to 6, also talks in the same way of uh, that they may be one over to Christ. So the goal is salvation for our family. So stay in the marriage so that your uh, spouse will be saved. Okay, let's just take a break and then we'll be back at 10 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> 